to his children, grandchildren actually. Letter to his grandchildren. You may have heard this over the years. But he says this. He says, we tried so hard to make things better for our kids that we made them worse. For my grandchildren, I'd like better. I'd really like for them to know about hand-me-down clothes and homemade ice cream and leftover meatloaf sandwiches. I really would. I hope you learn humility by being humiliated and that you learn honesty by being cheated. I hope you learn to make your own bed and mow the lawn and wash the car. And I really hope nobody gives you a brand new car when you're 16. It will be good if at least one time you can see puppies born and your old dog put to sleep. I hope you get a black guy fighting for something you believe in. I hope you have to share a bedroom with your younger brother or sister. And it's all right if you have to draw a line down the middle of the room, but when he wants to crawl under the covers with you because he's scared, I, I hope you let him. When you want to see a movie and your little brother or sister wants to tag along, I hope you'll let them. I hope you have to walk uphill to school with your friends and that you live in a town where you can do it safely. On rainy days when you have to catch a ride, I hope you don't ask your driver to drop you two blocks away so you won't be seen riding with someone as uncool as your own mom. And if you want a slingshot, I hope your dad teaches you how to make one instead of buying one for you. I hope you learn to dig in the dirt and read books. And when you learn to use computers, I hope you also learn to add and subtract in your head. I hope you get teased by your friends when you have to your first crash on a boy or girl and when you talk back to your mother that you learn what ivory soap tastes like. May you skin your knee climbing a mountain and burn your hand on a stove and stick your tongue on a frozen flagpole. I don't care if you have to try beer once but I hope you don't like it. And if a friend offers you dope or a joint I hope you realize he or she is not your friend. I sure hope you make time to sit on a porch with your grandma and grandpa or go fishing with your uncle. May you feel sorrow at a funeral and joy during the holidays. I hope your mother punishes you when you throw a baseball through your neighbor's window and that she hugs you and kisses you at Christmas time when you give her a plaster mold of your hand. These things I wish for you, tough times and disappointment, hard work and happiness, to me it's the only way to appreciate life. Mr. Harvey learned that hard times and personal sacrifice are very things that give humans a proper perspective. And having too easy a life can be as destructive as having a hard life. People that do not have to work at life are doomed to be bored and spoiled. Too much affluence in life usually makes one unappreciative for what they have and often creates a selfish, spoiled little brat. For believers to fulfill scripture in their own lives, they too must walk through some hard times so they can come to appreciate and show the love and grace of a wonderful and amazing God. You can be sure of the joy Christ placed in your heart, especially if you've ever lived with hardships or needs or in some kind of pain. Only then can you really appreciate what Jesus has done for you. Let's dive into our text and see what Jesus has to tell us today out of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, light has dawned. For from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. As Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets, and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Matthew wants us to know that Jesus was setting captives free. Captives of sin knew full well that they had been delivered from, well, 
whatever they had been delivered from. And they were grateful. Some of the people Jesus helped were in bondage from their own sins. And at times Jesus might say something like this, go and sin no more. Sometimes even those who have been forgiven of much are not willing to submit to the call of a master to sin no more. After Jesus offered healing and repentance to people in one area, he would move on to somewhere else and offer it there. And for the third time in Matthew, we see Jesus going to a new town to live for a while. You may remember that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Matthew reminded us in chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, that Micah had prophesied about this in his book in chapter 5, verse 2. And Jesus was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Their family's first move was from Bethlehem to escape Herod's anger, and to do so, the family went to Egypt. And in going to Egypt, Jesus' life somewhat emulated Moses. The second move of Jesus' family was their return to Israel after Herod's death, but the ruler that took over Herod's place caused the family to move to Nazareth to remain safe. And by doing so, Matthew tells us that prophecy was fulfilled yet again chapter 2, verse 23, where he says this, And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Do you see the stamp Matthew keeps putting? This is the fulfillment of prophecy. This Jesus. Another move brings Jesus to Capernaum. And with that move, Matthew 4, 14 through 16, tells us that another prophecy was fulfilled. To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee and the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, the light is dawned. In other words, these moves were foretold by God hundreds of years in advance of the ancient event. And because of this, we know that there are some things that we can, we can understand. One, Jesus is the Messiah. He, he fits the narrative. This is the Messiah. Two, we know that God is in control of these events. It's okay. God knew it was going to happen. God is still in control. And third, God is able to get his words of direction to us in the form of a book we call a Bible. Did you hear me? God gets his message to people. There is a push today to do away with most of what's in Scripture. Not abide by it. Not listen to it. To let culture run the show. But God is more than able to get us his word. And by these prophecies, Matthew's telling us, this is how you know God's in control and that Jesus is the Messiah. It all fits. It all works. God doesn't make mistakes. Matthew is telling the hearers that God was, has carefully orchestrated these geographical moves, and this is one way we can be sure that Jesus is the Messiah. And from Jesus' earliest days through his adult life and ministry, Matthew tells us that Jesus was an itinerant preacher, constantly wandering wherever the Holy Spirit led him. Jesus doesn't live for the comfort and security of the familiar or take the easiest path. Instead, Jesus embraces the Father's desires uh, to find those who are in need of hearing the word and a touch from God. The message of prophecy declares that God has promised to reach all the ethnic groups of the world. The light of God has come into the world to reach those who are in darkness and who are dying. And Jesus has come to them in a sense to become one of them by, their, by being their own neighbors. Jesus tells us that his first ministry location is known as Galilee of the Gentiles. And from every beginning in his ministry, from this very beginning, Jesus begins by fulfilling a prophetic promise to touch the people in ethnically diverse lands. In our own diverse culture here in the United States, some of us can identify with Jesus moving around. And move to a new place with new neighbors can be a thrilling move as well as intimidating at times. New surroundings can give us a sense of a new start, and starting with a nearly blank slate might give us the freedom to change how others perceive us and how we perceive ourselves. And new surroundings can also cause us to question everything about ourselves. Moving causes us to ask, who am I? And how do I best communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people where I now live? The richness of diverse communities can help us to understand not only others, but also understand ourselves better and make us reevaluate our own beliefs and how we can communicate that with others. In Capernaum, Jesus states the same message as John the Baptist was stating. 
John's arrest in 412 is the beginning of a critical transition where John decreases so that Christ can increase. The basic proclamation of Jesus and John is absolutely identical. And I quote, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In later chapters, chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus sends out his disciples to preach that very same message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Also at this time, John the Baptist is promised that Jesus would be a more powerful and important figure than himself. The power of God on Jesus becomes immediately evident. The call of Jesus' first followers is uh, profoundly uh, inspired by God. Jesus doesn't have to pitch the idea of what his ministry is going to look like to his followers, nor did he have to persuade them with a whole lot of words. Please realize that all of his followers really had no real reason to leave their current jobs. They didn't have a motivation to leave those jobs. They had a consistent way of living. They had comfort. They had jobs. They each seemed to have studied jobs and family ties to those individual locations and vocations. Also realize that these are unlikely people to be selected that could bring about spiritual and social change. These were not the influencers of their day. These fishermen are are not among the elite of the culture of their day. And Though Jesus' disciples will play a vital function in the earliest days of the church, on this particular day, they're just ordinary people doing ordinary jobs. I doubt seriously they understood what it would mean to become fishers of men, but they followed Jesus without question and without hesitation. There were many people that came out to John John the Baptist, looking to be baptized. Our text tells us that Jesus called a small group of men to follow his itinerant method of preaching and healing. Jesus was going. John was pretty static. He was out by the Jordan. He had his place. This was his thing. He didn't move around much. But Jesus, we're taking it to the streets, so to speak. And after he's gathered a small group of disciples, Jesus turns his focus to a work of ministry on earth. And he he also begins teaching in the synagogues, partly because he's now become of age and he's able to do so. He had to be about 30 uh, to be considered an adult and able to teach as one would teach in the synagogue, which is why he comes in and they would let him read. He read from Isaiah at one point uh, and then began to teach. He begins to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And a kingdom now gospel. Jesus heals the sick. He delivers the possessed from demonic activity. And these will be defining characteristics of his daily ministerial work in Matthew. Teaching, proclaiming, the kingdom, and healing are all components of a holistic ministry. For those of you that say Jesus was not political in his teaching, I I want to remind you it was the politicians of the day that hung him on a cross. He called them out on their hypocrisy and they killed him for it. Jesus proclaimed to all, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And to the humble, these words are freedom. But to the pride-filled, these words are a reminder of their current condition. And this call to repentance was spoken about 2,000, about 2,000 years ago now. Does this call still speak to us today? Is the kingdom of heaven still drawing near even today? More so than ever before, absolutely. It's it's vital to observe the close connection of preaching, teaching, and healing in Jesus' ministries. The the proclamation of the kingdom is not just a verbal thing, not just a teaching thing, but a series of actions designed to bring about healing and wholeness to individuals and entire communities. The reign of God is gone not only because Jesus spoke it into existence, but also because he was willing to heal the sick and make whole the broken and downtrodden. So it should not be an an embarrassment for us that Jesus proclaimed the coming of God's rule over this world so very long ago. Jesus believed deeply and showed just how powerfully God could reshape the world one person at a time. And 2,000 years later, we too can announce that the kingdom has come by residing in us personally. As believers, the kingdom of God, as born again believers, the kingdom of God should be set up in our hearts right now. So for us, the kingdom of God is not just near, it's in here. 
We are carriers of the kingdom of God. The work of proclamation, teaching, and healing Jesus started in this ethnic hotbed called Galilee has continued throughout the centuries and up to this very day. In fact, Jesus' closing words in Matthew commands the continuation of this sacrificial work of ministry. Now, in light of all this, what should we be telling people today? Should it be the same message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Well, some people today claim these words are outdated and they claim they're spoken of by preachers that are just living in the past. It's not a modern message. But unless people repent, they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. I hope that our text reminds us that the very same life-giving words and deeds Jesus used are still used today or to be used. Maybe these few verses can help remind us to proclaim the soon coming kingdom of God. I'm not suggesting we state them as a threat, but as a life-giving opportunity to be spared from that ultimate judgment that's coming. I'm also saying that someone who brings healing to others has a much better chance of warning them about a dangerous future that's coming than someone who doesn't. Certainly they have a better chance than someone who has done nothing to meet the physical, mental, or emotional needs of others. Jesus was the whole package. And he gave his servants the same authority and the same commandment to go and do likewise. He gave the servants authority then, and he gives his servants authority now as well. The question we have to ask ourselves is day in and day out, am I willing to go and be the fulfillment of Scripture? Will we be willing to step out of our personal comfort zones into a new place and help people with their needs so that we can give them the, we can actually earn the right to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Maybe not in so many words, but maybe like, would you like to receive Jesus and be forgiven for all your sins? Would you like that? Would you like to be at peace and know that you know that you know that if you die tonight, you will go to heaven? Is that an interest to you? When I was going to school in Minneapolis, I, I shadowed a street ministry team that worked, uh, there was kind of a North and a South Hennepin Avenue. The, the North Hennepin Avenue was an interesting place, but I want to talk about the South Hennepin Avenue. It's more like yuppies down there. You know, it's kind of a yuppieville. Kind of higher end, a little more elite, uh, but it was a partying gang. It was like a bar crawl every night. They were just circling around the street. Sidewalks were packed. People down there like crazy. And we were doing street ministry. And, and one night, I'd gone into a McDonald's to get warm. It, it gets cold in Minneapolis. If you've never been there, trust me, it's a lot colder than here. And so we went in to get a cup of coffee. And, and a couple people ran in to tell us. They came up to the table we were sitting at. And, and they said, uh, there's a man out here. He's a Christian, and he needs your help. And, and uh, so uh, anyway, we ran out to see what in the world was going on. Had no idea what had happened. And there's this guy laying on the street corner. And he's got bruises on his head and face in different places. And, and we were told that he had put a milk crate down in the corner. And he, they said he stood up on it. And he yelled at everyone saying, you're all going to hell. And there was a gentleman that didn't really like that phrase who was right in front of him at the time. And he said, yeah, and you're leading the way. And he popped him right on the jaw, knocked him off of the milk crate, down, knocked him out, down on the concrete, which is where he got some of the bruising and whatnot. And uh, I share that horrible story with you because we are to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in love. Amen? In love. It's the only way we're going to help them with their hurts, their habits, and their hang-ups. They need to feel your love first before they're going to let you help them with their souls. One of the people that came to get us that night, after everything had kind of cleared up, we got him cleaned up, and he walked off. Uh, this person came up, this young lady came up. She said, I'm so sorry somebody would do this, to which we replied, why are you sorry? It's not your fault. You weren't the one that hit him. And she said, no, nobody would ever do this to you guys because we know you're here to help. You care about people. You guys buy food for people to eat that help them with shelter. But this guy, nobody knows. And people, all they heard him say was, go to hell. That's all they heard. And she was right. 
Listen, church, you can proclaim repent the kingdom of heaven is here. You can be successful if you're willing to love people to help them where they are. If you think harsh, hateful words are going to get you results, remember the guy that got cold cocked. And think again. You can't harbor pride over others and expect to win their souls. You have to love and have as love your motivation or you're going to find yourself causing more pain and might even get hurt yourself. But realize that when you're helping others, there are always going to be users, people who use you. There will always be the people that just want to take whatever it is you're willing to give. They will use you. They will abuse you until you finally catch on to their games. I had a call from a guy last week, and he said, actually the week before last now, he said that no church in the area would even call him back. And he named one church he said he used to go to, and, and they won't even help me at all. So I called that church pastor, a friend of mine, and I said, you I got to talk to you about what this guy has left a message and what he, what he said in the message. And he said, you know, he said, we've helped that guy for about 40 years. He said, we help him. And he said, sometimes his request, he can help himself in half of what he's asking for help on. He said, but we still love him and we help him and we're doing everything he can. And he said, I don't know why he says bad things about us. We've helped him. And helped him and helped him and helped him and helped him. He said the man has come to expect help. But he refuses to help himself. Listen, I don't care how long you help some toxic people. They're still going to bite you in the back when they have a chance. But don't take it personally. And don't stop reaching out to others to proclaim the message of repentance. Jesus faced numerous hostile people, but he never stopped helping the hurting and proclaiming repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. He didn't stop until they hung him on a cross and he had no choice. Jesus loves people. Jesus truly, unashamedly loves people. All people. Not the kind of love that gives itself only to those who can return it somehow. But Jesus loves with the kind of love that loves in spite of the response that they get from others. Can you love like that? Do you love like that? We love others because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's only right that we are servants of God and we should take up our cross and follow Christ's example in all ways. How are we going to do that? Are we doing it? If not, then we need to begin at the beginning and repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. We need to take up our cross and go to what the master taught us to do and commissioned us to do and expects us to do. And then on that day, we'll hear those beautiful words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Maybe we need to find a place to pray this morning. Maybe we need to repent. Regardless, we should ask God to give us a love for his word and a love for the lost. And then ask God to send workers into the fields. For the fields are right, but the workers are few. Therefore, Jesus said, ask me to send them. But more than that, I think we should be willing to be the fulfillment of his scripture. And be willing to be sent in our own lives. And only then can we be confident that we'll hear those words one day. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. We're going to sing a song of invitation. It's 348. Your hymnals will be on the screen as well. And if you would like to come this morning and spend some time with us.